What's up guys? Can you believe this is the last time I, we're gonna do this lecture, online lecture? It's bittersweet really because it's been nice to be able to communicate with you guys and do this on YouTube, but I do really miss speaking to you guys in class and doing all those fun things we do. So I can't wait to return in the fall, but here we go. Last time lecture in my house on the nice TV here. Okay, so we are now just gonna continue off from where we left off last time. And that of course is the blessed Trinity in our Christian vocation chapter. And we learned a lot about what faith looks like, not only interiorly in our hearts and our minds and our relationship with God, but also how that faith is manifested or carried out in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So the very important thing to remember when it comes to learning about faith is faith is not something that just is uh, subjective. It's not just something that I have my faith, I bottle up, it, I bottle it up inside, and it's just mine. No, it's it's more than that. It has to be more than that to be faith. We can't just believe in something and not carry it out, right? It, it's called integrity. If you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk, right? As the saying goes. So when we talk about faith, we we learned a little bit about what it is. It's a free gift from God a grace from God given to us freely and undeserved. And then finally, how we can manifest or carry that out in our day-to-day -day lives. And we saw that we can do that in the sacraments by attending mass, going to confession, etc. But also in, the, in, our, in our daily lives when we meditate on his word, on the Bible, right? When we, when we look at the scriptures, we can get, encounter God in our day-to-day -day lives. And then finally, of course, is in prayer. So let's take a sponge, for example, right? If we're going to talk about faith, let's take a sponge. The things I just described to you, I would say is more about soaking it in, right? The sacraments, uh, reading scripture, praying to God. These are ways in which we soak in the reality or presence of God. And now in this lecture, it's more so how can we kind of extinguish or <laughs> rip out all that water or wring out all that water in that sponge and kind of pour ourselves back out to humanity. And there's going to be kind of really two significant ways in which we do that. Number one is obviously living out kind of a virtuous life. And my example I will, I will speak about in a second is St. Paul. But then finally, our vocation, right? How we, how we end up living our lives uh, until we die, right? And there's kind of two ways we can do that. One, getting married. And then two, uh, if called, maybe to the priesthood or becoming a sister in a convent. Um, and that's really going to be our ultimate fulfillment as Christians. So again, we recapped, we looked about how do we soak it in? How do we kind of live a life of faith? Today, I want to talk about how can we pour it back out to others in the right way. So there's a famous passage in scripture by St. James. And St. James says, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, which means if you're going to tell me you have faith separate from what you do, then that doesn't really seem to be like faith. So he counters that and says, I'm not going to um, tell you I have faith. I'm going to show you. So he says, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. So St. James is kind of giving up what these famous philosophers would say, existential argument here. He's saying, I'm going to show you my faith by what I do in my life. I don't have to say anything. You'll know by the things I do that I am a Christian. Whether, whether some people at his time were saying, yeah, I'm Christian, but they were living these very immoral and pagan lifestyles. So again, St. James is going to get just stick it right to our hearts. Look, stop talking and start walking, right? Show us you're a Christian. And that's the most beautiful part about professing the Christian faith is that it's not something we just go to mass, say our prayers and walk out and punch our ticket. No, it should be carried out in, in our conversations. It should be carried out in our, in our actions. Uh, it should be really everything we kind of do is towards the glory of God. So that's just following up here on this bottom point is that if we profess to be Christian by God, we better carry it out in our day-to-day -day, day -day lives. So now let's take an example in this slide. And that example is St. Paul. And before I get into my example, I want to give you another example. 
So my we or my brother flew in from San Francisco the other day, and my family is very uh, conversational, and we go we really do the hot topics. As you already probably can tell from me in class, I like to talk about things that are important. So during the dinner at the dinner table, you know my brother and my family often will talk about politics, religion, you know anything you can think of really. Uh, we'll talk about and my brother brought up well how is it possible that people can believe uh, in a God or proclaim to be Christian uh, if the people that are running the faith or the institution are corrupt so of course he lists off many different examples and I my counter my counter response to that is well it's not so much the people that I believe in um, it's more so the teachings that I that I profess you know, it's, it's the teachings of the church that I claim to believe in, not the people, right? So I don't worship the Pope. I don't worship the priest at my parish. I, I worship God, and I do that by believing in the teachings of the church. And if we look at our history carefully, the person that instituted the church is, of course, Jesus Christ. All that being said, all that being said and put aside, I say that because proclaiming to be Christian is not proclaiming to be perfect. And St. Paul is the best example for that. St. Paul lived a very religious lifestyle. And in the beginning, early years of his life, he actually murdered those who professed to be Christian. And so as you can see, that's very, very a serious offense against God. And so after a while, uh, St. Paul has a huge conversion to Christianity. He has a vision of Jesus, has a very intimate moment with him. And then decides that no more, uh, he puts off this old man, this kind of uh, murderous um, Jewish faith, and then turns into a kind of very strong and moral Christian. And after St. Paul's conversion, he decided to preach to the world. He would travel miles and miles, hundreds and hundreds of miles by foot, by boat. People would try and stone him to death. They locked him in prison. He found ways to continue to preach and pray and live out the Christian faith, even though he proclaimed to be the worst of all sinners. And so again, I, I just want to let you guys know that Christianity is not about proclaiming I'm perfect just because I believe in God. No, in fact, it's quite the opposite, right? It's, it's I'm willing to confess my faults and to get back up and to keep trying to do better. And St. Paul is the perfect example that we can look to, to someone who had not only good faith, but also someone who tirelessly and relentlessly try to preach that and give it to other people. So to cap that off, to cap this slide off, you know, Christianity is about believing in God, but also having conversations, um, showing people by being a good witness, right? Being able to pray in public, being able to talk to people about your faith, being able to, you know, do things that glorify God. Continuing on with St. Paul, our next slide, St. Paul is going to tell us a very important fact about our bodies. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And he says this precisely to let us know that our bodies are sacred. All right. And we're kind of now gearing towards uh, what we would specifically call theology of the body. Okay. And when we talk about theology of the body, this is, again, a way in which we live out our faith through marriage, through the marriage vows. And as you all know, and I'm going to try and keep this brief, as you all know, our job as human beings is to reflect God's image, right? The more perfectly you reflect God, the more fulfilled you are as a, uh, as a human being, right? Again, the more perfectly you reflect God, the more perfectly you are fulfilled as a human person, okay? And we perfectly reflect God when we are in relationships with others. Now that might sound strange, right? You might, would th you might think that, oh, I perfectly reflect God when I'm praying or when I go to mass. Actually, it's different. Remember, God is a trinity. God himself is a community of persons. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, Holy Spirit, right? All God, all distinct persons. So when we engage in relationships with others, we engage kind of in a sacred way, right? So what does marriage specifically signify? Marriage represents the Trinity. The, the father pours himself out to the son 
and the son receives that love and reciprocates that love back to the father. And through that love, that bond that unites them is love, which actually, strangely enough, mysteriously enough, is a person, the Holy Spirit. So the man pours himself out to the wife and the wife receives that love and reciprocates it back to the man. And there's a bond that unites them. That, of course, is love. And that love, the result of that love is a person or a child. Okay. And so when we talk about theology of the body, when we talk about why does God give us bodies, it's so that we can express ourselves in a Trinitarian way, in a God-like way. So that when we give ourselves to another person, right, in the context of marriage, in the context of sexuality, we give them, uh, we express that in the right context. We, we live a life of love, ultimately. We cherish the other person. We uh, love that person till, till death do us part, right? We make vows to that person. And so marriage is ultimately the uh, pinnacle, the, the highest way we can reflect God. So some key points to kind of sum what I, what I set up. Number one, God created me out of love, right? God loves us and he creates us out of love. God created me for love, right? So not only am I created out of love, but I'm specifically supposed to love others. He created me for the purpose of loving. And so God invites me to give that love to others. My next point is kind of a, a follow-up here, and that is the law of the gift of self, right? And that's going to be on your guys' test, the law of gift of self. And we have to obey this law, that God has created us always to be gifts towards others, gifts of love, right? Not indulging and uh, using people for our self-satisfaction. -satisf we don't use others to gratify ourselves. So when we talk about relationships with others, we're supposed to serve others, right? And we see this uh, most clearly in marriage, right? When we give ourselves to another person, body and soul, for the rest of our lives, there's no greater expression than that. There's no greater expression in love than the vows of marriage. And so, as you see here, we are made to be a gift. And so, Again, guys, read these last slides. If you guys have questions, please email me. I would love to help you out. This is a very, very sensitive and difficult topic to talk about, especially on a lecture like this. But it's very important to realize, especially as young men and women, that you are on your way to, to working towards your final goal as a person. If you want happiness, if you want fulfillment, it's ultimately your final vocation, which is marriage. Before I send you off, I just want to let you know that we, again, are here to represent, to mimic, to manifest the reality of God. And we do that perfectly when we enter into the vows of marriage. Now, there's a couple questions I'm sure that pop through your head. What about people that don't get married? What about priests? All those kinds of things. Yes, that's perfectly okay. You still can love God. But remember, Priests are married to God, so they kind of live a marriage vocation uh, by loving God, by serving God, by marrying God in a way. For those who never get married, uh, that's definitely possible, and uh, it does not mean that God loves them any less. However, again, if we're going to talk about something that's like a perfect symbol, what perfectly imitates the Trinity, we're going to talk about marriage, and that's the relationship, the union, the love among persons. So again, questions, anything like that, let me know. And I am saying goodbye for the final time. Look forward to seeing you guys as soon as possible. Take care.